Hi again, everyone. Sorry for the long hiatus. I've actually been harpsichordless, at least at home. I didn't really feel like lugging recording equipment around to where I needed to practice was was really worth it. So um, I've waited until now when I have a harpsichord again at home, a very cute little Italian. So um, we're back in business. And today we get to talk about something that I think is very important, uh, not only for improvisation, but of course composition and, and in fact performance. Uh, and that is structure. Structure in, in composition dates all the way back to um, ancient Roman times, and in fact, we still use these rhetorical principles that are found in the treatises of Quintilian and Cicero, and these ideas underlie all, certainly all of Baroque music, um, and they even underlie tons of things in everyday life, um, not just art. Uh, you know, you'll find it in um, for example, the plot of movies, the plot that you learned in school, you know, the rising action, falling action, and all that, that's all based on um, forms that are thousands of years old. And uh, we can have a discussion about this maybe some other time, but uh, I think it's pretty cool that it, it appears that humans sort of prefer things packaged a certain way, um, and, and it all has to do with these rhetorical principles. So we're not actually going to get into um, the nitty-gritty of, of, of old rhetoric, but what we're going to do is introduce some helpful formulae um, for structuring your improvisations that will make them inherently more sensible and therefore will allow you to communicate more clearly and hold a little, a little bit fewer things in your head, which is always better when you're improvising. Um, and hopefully this will be able to get you going um, thinking about some more complicated structures. And we'll touch on all of this rhetoric stuff, but um, we'll spend only a little bit of time uh, this, this time uh, on theory, and mostly I will uh, annotate some improvised examples for you, and uh, hopefully it'll be clear what I'm talking about. All right, let's hop in. Alrighty, so where to begin with structure and improvisation? Well, let's just get down a few basics before we dive into this formalism that I think is going to be helpful. Um, all pieces of music have, in a most basic sense, uh, well, they're structured in the following way. They have essentially a beginning, a middle, and an end. And what exactly are these things supposed to do? Well, there's a lot of answers to this question, and perhaps some other time um, we can actually get into um, the, you know, the hard details of this and talk about how this relates to these old rhetorical practices. But for now, let's just talk about a few that, um, that we know work that are simple. So for now, we're going to make the simplification that the beginning and the end should be similar. So the end is sort of like a recap. All right. The beginning should, of course, introduce motives, establish a key, Um, and, and have a clear ending, I think. Okay, the middle is where all the interesting stuff happens, but it's also the highest risk, because we can easily start wandering around and uh, sounding like, you know, we don't know what we're doing. So the middle is actually something to be careful of, and here we should probably at the very least, take care to know where we're going to end up. There are a few different key areas that make sense, given a tonic, to end up by the end of the middle section. Um, namely, those that have satisfying um, transitions back into one. So, actually, you can do this with almost any key area, but some of the, the very easiest are um, the subdominant, actually the mediant, believe it or not, um, also two, and uh, of course the relative minor. Believe it or not, um, it's not great to find yourself in the dominant before you need to go back to uh, the tonic. I know that sounds totally ridiculous and counterintuitive, but um, I promise it's true. Uh, if you look 
for example, in Bach, you'll find that if he does find himself in this position, what he'll do is overshoot one, go to four, and then go back to one, very often. Um, and, and one reason for that is that um, when you flat seven and you go to four, whether that's four of five, of course, which is one, or, or whether that's you know four of something else, um, it sounds more like a pivot than a return. Whereas if you're coming from four, for example, you have, um, you have the rising five six sequence at your disposal. And that sounds a lot more satisfying because it sounds like an arrival. So sharping four uh, actually sounds, I think, a little bit more final than flatting seven. And so for this reason, I think it's much better to find yourself in four right before you need to be back in one than it is to find yourself in five. Okay, all of that said, there's a, a couple other things to know before you sit down. Uh, there are two actually major things, and then we're going to get into uh, a, a fun way to analyze music that we can use to uh, formulate structures that uh, are helpful. So, two important reminders. For all improvisations, before you sit down, you should know the tempo, and you should have some motive in your head. And oh, I can talk about this for a minute. Um, of course, you don't want to pick a tempo that's too fast, and you, uh, you probably don't want to pick a tempo that's too slow either, but, but going too slow is much better than going too fast, because going too fast, as, as we all know, is very risky, whether it's performance or improvisation, and it's about 100 times riskier in improvisation. So a good way to evaluate whether you're at a good tempo is to, after you think of a motive, consider some different things you could do with that, uh, and, and if you think you could play it at the tempo that your brain is conceiving it, then that's a fine tempo. Um, and in fact, what I do is I start by thinking of a motive for some sequence, um, some pattern that I know can flesh out a sequence of some kind. Uh, and then I'll just build a theme out of that, so that by the time the sequence comes back around, I sound like I'm brilliant and that I've incorporated this theme in a sequence, but in reality I've just reverse engineered it um, to, to fall on top of some cadence pattern and start the piece. The second thing to remember uh, is that you should keep it short. I really think this is a pretty important rule in improvisation. Um, you could be doing the greatest thing ever, and you could keep it going for a long time. And the second that you stop doing it, or you do something that doesn't make sense, or you know you slip up more than once, um, it really kind of kills it. I mean, of course, it, of course, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make it all not worth it. But it's much better to keep it short because it's it's more digestible for the audience, and it's just less risky. Um, it's also a lot clearer and easier for you to keep these structures in your head if you keep it short. And of course, if you're used to improvising um, tight structures that are short, then it becomes easier for you to elaborate on certain parts of those structures and make them longer later. Okay, so let's move on to this formalism that I've been hinting at. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you all to something that I call the TSCR formalism. Uh, I'm sure that I wasn't the one who invented this. I'm sure there's something you know, that is much more fleshed out and, uh, and clever out there in the ether. But um, this is something that I arrived at myself. Uh, I make no claims to being the first one to think of it. Um, this is just something that um, I use with my students and uh, for my own studies um, that, uh, that arose out of noticing some patterns in certain music. So before we begin, <clears throat> and I tell you what this is all about and why we care about it and how it has to do with structure, um, let me just point out that this doesn't work for all Baroque music. So, um, not all music will yield to this treatment. Um, but, some important music will. Uh, namely, pretty much all German or Italian high Baroque music. So, um, that includes certainly includes Bach, which it was sort of built to analyze. Um, definitely includes Corelli, Handel, and Friends. 
What it certainly does not work for is French Baroque music, so you won't be able to use this for Kupran or Louis, um, and you probably... Well, I've never tried. It would be really interesting to see where Mufat falls on all this, since he's such a, a mutt when it comes to that type of thing. Um, but uh, in any case, th this type of music is, is, is built on, on melodic principles um, and won't yield to this treatment. And um, you'll see why when I show you what these things stand for. So T is for theme. S is for sequence. And we can be a slightly more general. C is for cadence, and R is for transition. And let's talk about what these things do. All right, so we all know what themes are. They're the things that the audience can hold on to as we play, and they're the things that, as improvisers, we should keep in our heads so that we can come back to them later and riff on them. Importantly, themes are very often built out of cadence harmonies or cadence patterns. Uh, and sometimes they're built out of sequences, um, but uh, more often actually they're, they're built out of cadences. Uh, and I'll show you a couple examples. Um, some very common opening gambits include, I'll just do all this in C major, the so-called quiescenza, which is uh, something like this. how long that goes on. It's over a pedal. Um, another one is um, this guy. Sometimes this is just a regular old 5-2. It's more rare. Uh, here's another one. Um, and, and these are actually all, uh, well, well, with the exception of this guy, which is sort of a, uh, a, um, an outlier, uh, all of these patterns are sort of just one, four, five, one. Um, if you go and look at some of your favorite Baroque music, almost all of it starts with some version of one, four, five, one or one, five, one. Uh, it's just a, a, a long drawn out cadence pattern. So bear that in mind when you're constructing things to work with. Um, here, here's here's an example of the opening to Box English Suite number four, which we'll analyze later. Uh, actually, it's in trouble, but it goes like this. And it's an octave lower, but So if I were to put a bass line to this, it might be something like that. Uh, right, one, four, five, one. Uh, and, and of course, you know, it, it doesn't, it, they're, they're not so literal all the time, but um, I promise this, this turns out to be true. So go ahead and, uh, and try to find examples that, that don't do this, and, and those will, will truly be the exceptions. Okay, sequences are used to either confirm or transport. So when they confirm, they stay in the same key area. And when they transport us, they take us to a different key area. And they're used as um, structural sort of pillars to hold everything together. Um, they often will come after cadences, or they will precede them. And they can be used sort of as glue to put everything together. 
So if the themes are the sort of bones um, and the cadences are the joints or ligatures, then sequences are sort of the muscles and tendons. Cadences, of course, act as punctuation, uh, namely commas and semicolons and periods. Um, and we use these to put little ribbons around sections um, and, uh, and use them as springboards for new ones. Um, importantly, I think an important trick um, in improvisation with cadence is that it's a good place to introduce new material. Because often cadences will come after things have been spun out and some of the most interesting things um, will happen right before a cadence. The harmonic motion usually increases at the cadence, especially in Baroque music. Um, and so when you're spinning things out, you know, you can generate sort of new material from elaborations on something that was going on. And at cadences, they will sound particularly natural, um, as opposed to you introducing, you know, some mutation in the middle of a sequence, which won't be as convincing. And this is useful because you can then use whatever new material you generated to continue after the cadence. And, and this is a way for you to avoid sort of playing, you know, the same theme over and over again in different ways, which can get tiresome quickly um, and can sound like, you know, you don't know what you're doing or you're just sort of repeating yourself. Um, so cadences are a good place to introduce this new material, and then you can use that new material after the cadence. And then when the time arises for you to reintroduce the stuff that you started with, then it will sound really nice when it comes back and, and, uh, and those ideas will be quite welcome um, when they return. The last thing, transitions, is sort of just a catch-all. Um, to include things that transport, but that don't necessarily fall under um, sequences. Um, they, sorry, they transport from one key to another. Um, they can, they're often made up of many sort of smaller sequence bits that are stuck together. Um, or they're made up of different cadences that go to different keys that are stuck together. Or they're made up of um, avoided cadences or um, prolongations of certain tones or things like that. And so transitions are just sort of uh, a catch-all for these things. And you'll find that these things are, are all related, just like I said that uh, themes are related to sequences and cadences and in fact transitions are very often made up of these things just um, just mixed in such a way that it's it's not always completely obvious and in fact they're less common than you might think so let's look at some uh, some Bach just uh, so you can see what I mean and then I can show you what you can do with this all right so I have in front of me Bach's fourth English suite in F major and I picked this mostly because I just played it, so I know it pretty well. Um, and I'm just going to use this as a way, uh, just as a proof of, proof of concept of, of this, uh, namely that you know you can label pretty much everything you find as either a T, an S, a C, or an R. So I think we can all agree that this is a theme. And you'll notice right away uh, one of the very common structures that we're going to talk about right after this, uh, which is that the theme comes in tonic and then it's just restated in the tonic again in a different voice and there are some variations of this that we can discuss um, starting here and going all the way until probably there we've got a sequence that takes us from 1 to 5 then this is a cadence and notice of course both the sequence and uh, this cadence are um, built off of uh, this theme. Uh, in fact, uh, this sequence is built out of this counter subject here, uh, but otherwise the material is new. Uh, this cadence is built out of, um, of the theme uh, in, in usual Bach fashion. So of course, you know, the lines between these things are uh, blurry. It's not always black and white, but, but nonetheless, we, we label them based on their function. So starting here, we have a, a sequence that uh, eventually takes us to here. So we have a cadence in one. So the sequence takes us from 5 to 1. And um, now Bach would probably usually, or 1 would usually end 
the, the exposition here, but as I mentioned before, it's not that satisfying to um, introduce flat seven and then cadence. Um, it doesn't sound that final. It sounds like you've gone somewhere new. Uh, so what Bach does is he transitions back to five, um, which seems like he's going in circles, but then he introduces a new sequence here. So here's another cadence, five. Uh, then he introduces a new sequence here, um, based of course on a theme. Um, and this takes him at first back to one and then to four with that E flat. And he has another sequence, which brings him finally from four to one, which uh, again, as I mentioned, um, is particularly satisfying. And then he's got this little deception, which acts to make things uh, very final. And then of course, here we get um, the final cadence pattern to end the exposition. So just to distill everything that's gone on here, um, we sort of had a theme, which was stated twice, both times in the tonic, some sequences that traded places. And then uh, some other sequences um, and cadences that uh, sort of took us to four and acted to create a sense of finality so that we could cadence in one and know that we are in fact done with the exposition. And here, of course, we have another theme we'll called that T prime, I suppose. But it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this formalism now, and, and let's let's look at some really common uh, combinations of, of these things. And I'll just mention really quickly, uh, before I change the screen here, that it usually does come in this order. Usually you will find T before S before C, and, and R's don't usually come until the middle. Okay, so let's look really quickly at some common constructions um, that we can build from these pieces. As I said before, with the beginning, middle, and end, what you'll find most often is that the beginning has um, sort of, uh, a, basically it amounts to a T, S, C, as we saw with the Bach. I mean, the Bach was sort of, you know, T, B, S, S, C, S, 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 C, or something like that. Um, but really, it just kind of went back and forth between one and five, and um, it all sort of distilled down into what amounted to, to a T, S, C. In the middle, you'll find, um, you know, more complicated or strange combinations of these things. You'll find many sequences together, or many statements of the theme together, and this, this X and Y here just means that there's two different keys, uh, two different key areas. Um, you'll find a transition to one key area, and then maybe something is stated, or maybe you'll have a transition followed by another transition. Um, things in the middle are, are not quite as uh, predictably structured as things in the beginning. Uh, and, and this harkens back to these rhetorical principles I mentioned right at the introduction. Um, you know, this is uh, just like when you watch a movie, you expect certain things to be set up in the beginning, you meet the characters, you, um, you have the setting, and you sort of get a taste for what their lives are like, and then everything is, you know, upended, and, um, and you know, some stuff happens, and all of a sudden there's all this turmoil, and then right before the end it gets resolved, and then things go back to normal you know, there's a happy ending or something like that. So the beginning sets something up, the middle creates some type of tension or elaboration, and then the tension is resolved at the end. And by the time we get to the end, we usually, well, not usually, I should say. Uh, this is actually, I guess, just a personal preference um, when I compose and, and when I improvise, um, which is that um, the end is sort of a, an abridged version uh, of the beginning. Um, often you'll find, I mean, you know, especially in sonata form and, and even in, in the, the first movement of, of the Bach English Suite that we just looked at, you will find the beginning stated in full at the end. Uh, and sometimes, um, you know, it might not even be in one like it is always in the classical era. Bach has this crazy thing where he will actually um, have uh, beginnings that end in five and then recaps that begin in four so that by the time he gets back to the end, it's now in one. Uh, so there are a lot of different things you can do with this. Um, let's just talk about the beginning here, because that's mostly what we'll be analyzing. There's a couple of really basic elaborations that we should know about. There's the one that we saw in the Bach, namely that you have a theme stated in one, and then a theme stated in one in a separate voice, often. Uh, often it's just a right-hand, left-hand thing followed by some type of sequence, 
and then a cadence, whether that be in five or one. If it's in five, this sequence will be modulating. If it's in one, the sequence will be um, confirming. A very related construction is if you have the theme in one, uh, and then you have the theme again in five, uh, and then you have um, a little sequence which takes you back to one, or perhaps this is a really, really tiny transition that takes you back to one. Um, in fugues, for example, the transition is built into the fugue subject, um, and you have some cadence here. Or you can have a 1-5-1 one, one deal, and then you can cadence, and then you can sequence, at which point you will probably need to um, either transition to somewhere new after this, or you can tie it off again with a sequence. So these are some really, really basic uh, constructions that we can use with with TSC um, that you can um, that you can use in your own improvisations and uh, and I'll show you exactly how this works in practice now so I'm gonna improvise some examples based on um, these structures and I'm going to uh, just put little subtitles under them uh, so that you know where we are
So that's all for my little primer on structure and improvisation. If you all have any questions, you can always write me in the comments or you can message me on Facebook. And hopefully it won't be so long until I see you again. Until then.